So I used to be a TV reporter, so I thought it would be fun just to start out with an example from my recording. It's only a couple minutes long. It's not a example of storytelling by any means, but it does exemplify a couple of the principles that I'm going to be talking about today, and it's it's kind of funny. So I didn't even see my teeth laying there. Her whole face. Can you guys hear that at all? Yes. Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure it picked up the sound. Sometimes on the screen share, the sound doesn't come through right. All right. I didn't even see my teeth laying there. Her whole face was bloody. It was, it was unreal. Oh, I was so thankful. It was a day Lois Fish will never forget. He was there. It happened so fast, I, could, I couldn't believe it. She was on the phone with her daughter and decided to clean some leaves out of her pond with her free hand. She lost balance and fell head first. Scared to death. Not knowing how to swim and not being able to touch bottom, she clung to the lip as her winter robe weighed her down. If it hadn't been for John, I'd probably been a goner. Her husband was inside asleep, so she yelled for the only person she could think of. Hoping, hoping he was home, hoping he was outside, because everybody else was in church. She yells out a big scream for me. He came over that six-foot fence like it wasn't even there. John stood on this edge here and struggled to lift her out of the pond alone. Didn't know if I could get her out, and somehow, some way, I brought her up out of the water. I thank God for John. Since that accident two weeks ago, Fish has had her mouth put back together and her thumb doctored. She's also made a new rule, no talking on the phone near the pond. I don't care if the president called, I could not answer the phone, would not answer the phone. No way, no way. All right, so there's that. <laughs> now you know a little bit about me and my history. Um, it's a fun story. It does, it does some things pretty well, and obviously, I mean, this isn't a TV reporter's seminar. You know, you're not going to be creating videos necessarily. Maybe you will be, and that's, that's fine. Um, and I'd be happy to give pointers specific to that, but there are some general storytelling principles that um, we're going to be talking about. So I really think that there are four main pieces to any good story, and the first two are not very... Um, the word sexy keeps coming to mind, but I wanted to avoid that word, but there it is. It's out there. Um, gathering information is not, uh, you know, it's not the most attractive thing to be doing, right? It's, um, it's working hard. It's um, just getting the facts. It's doing interviews. It's getting good pictures. It's getting good sound bites or um, all that jazz. And it takes the most time right and then there's a lot of work or perspiration that goes into thinking about how to frame a story and um all that time i mean no one really gets to see how much work goes into a story behind the scenes and ultimately you create a work product that you will hopefully engage people with and inspire them through and so we're going to start by talking about the gathering phase and i love this quote by our dear um, Prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Does anyone know how to fill in the blanks there? Good inspiration is based upon good what? Anyone know, Tommy? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess. Good inspiration is based upon good... Preparation. Preparation's a good one. I like that. Uh, he actually says information. Um, and so yeah. any good story, with the inspiration we're trying to share and also receive about people in their lives um, is going to begin by gathering good information. And so how do you go about getting the best information possible? Um, you cast a really broad net in the information gathering phase. If you try to throw in the most compelling content, there's going to be so many details about any given event or person that are good but they're not um the most compelling details and so it's a matter of weeding out the lesser compelling and zeroing in on the most compelling and so in order to do that you have to cast, cast a really broad net and of course you're asking all the typical questions who what when where why how um to get the context of what's going on as you try to identify, you know, what's novel about this particular thing? You know, maybe the J. Reuben Clark Law Society does the same event every year. Well, what's different about it this year? Maybe it's 
who. Maybe there's somebody attending, somebody presenting who has a really compelling story that we can highlight. Or maybe it's the where. You know, we've never been able to host a, a conference in Russia before, you know, and we, we focus on, on the where and we dig deep into whatever is the most compelling. And so um, you do kind of a broad search going through the motions of who, what, when, where, why, how, and then there's going to be specific what's or why's or how's or who's or when's that stand out. And then you want to dig really deep into that particular element rather than giving superficial coverage of everything. You're going to give deep coverage of the most compelling component of the story. And so you're looking for unique angles. Um, you're doing interviews, you're recording people. If you're getting video, you're snapping some photos um, to get some different perspectives. And so you cast that really broad net. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, one thing that we like for any story for the BYU Law Alumni Association and for the Jerome Clark Law Society is at least one photo. And nowadays, thankfully, smartphones can snap pretty good pictures for the most part. And so that could be sufficient for our web purposes. Just a few, few pointers in, in getting photos. Um, one has to do with where the light source is. You generally don't want the light in front of the camera because it will blow out the background. I mean, if you look at this picture of the guy holding the phone, taking the picture of the trail, you can tell that the light source is, is behind um, whoever's holding the, the phone's back. Right, the hands well lit, the phone is well lit, um, and you can. And the forest is a little bit darker because it's further away from from the sun behind uh, the individual. And if the sun were coming from down the trail, I mean, you might not even be able to see what's on the screen at, uh, at all and appreciate, you know, the symmetry and also the duplicativeness of having you know the trail and then the trail within the trail within that picture. And so it's kind of a fun picture, but I put it there just as an example of be cognizant of where the light source is. You want um, to, by and large, have your light source um, be such so that the, the focus of your picture is the best lit thing and not the background behind it. You can take some really snazzy photos with it being backlit, but you usually need a more expensive camera and it's a lot trickier to do and there are a lot more artsy type photos. And so um, if you're, you know, just an amateur trying to get some basic coverage of an event or a person, then just follow the basic rule there. Uh, this picture of this bird I, I included, um, just to, to remind you that uh, focus is really important. Um, obviously, the bird here is the focus and the background is not. And so um, we don't want blurry pictures. And so what I would do on your phone is if you're snapping a picture of a group, don't just snap one photo, you know, snap a, a few of that same photo because phones have these autofocus features. And if, and if you snap a photo and it's in between focus, it's, you know, it's not going to be perfect. But if you snap a few photos, odds are that at least one or two is going to be in focus how it should be. And then you can use that one for the web. Uh, this this other picture you see of this flower I, I put in here just to to show you a little bit about framing. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this again. These are just some very, very basic rules. And I apologize if you're already familiar with these rules. But um, there are some times where your, your subject, the thing you want the, the looker to focus on, is going to be center, just smack dab in the middle, just in the crosshairs of the picture, just like that bird, or just like the phone um, in the trail. That is, you know, right in the middle, a nice symmetry to it. And there's nothing wrong with centering a subject. And it certainly can be handy for thumbnails or for things that show up in a square, you know, picture that would show up in a Facebook feed. But if you're not going to center the subject, the other locations where it can be really nice to place the subject um, are along these rule of third lines. Any of you guys heard of the rule of thirds before? And I don't know, I'm just guessing where the, the third lines would be here. But um, you slice up you know, your image into ninths by just drawing these, these lines to divide it into thirds horizontally and vertically. And where these lines intersect, those are good places to place your subject. So this flower is in the upper right hand intersection 
of the of the thirds and you've got four spots in any photo that you could potentially focus on and you may use um you know the spots um the different spots at different times if you're doing like a landscape photo you might focus more on the bottom third right and leave some more room for the sky um, Another thing that's nice about the rule of thirds is if you're doing an interview or if you have um, someone looking or moving in a direction, you can give them ample lead room or headroom. Um, so say you've got a subject here in this, um, we're focusing, we put the head of a guy in this third right there, the intersection of those two lines, and he's looking this way. Um, that's nice because it, you know, if he's looking, if he's moving that way, he doesn't feel like he's falling off. He's got plenty of canvas to move into and it just feels more natural. I feel like the rule of thirds, um, kind of makes, makes sense in part because it's just been used so much that we're accustomed to seeing these kind of th things. I'm not sure if it's a chicken or the egg first type thing where the rule of thirds is just some natural law that we try to follow, or it's just something that everybody's been following and therefore we're used to it and we want to see it and it feels professional but it is what it is and so i would encourage you to use it a um, couple other things and just your gathering some tools there are some free um, apps to record if you're doing an interview of someone and i would strongly recommend doing that um, rather than trying to it can be good to take some basic you know shorthand notes from an interview but um, in the moment, that person you're interviewing might not have a lot of time, um, but if you record your conversation with them, get their permission, of course, then you can always look back later and double check that you heard things correctly, and you can, you can gather a lot more information. And I wouldn't write out that whole recording verbatim, but um, you know, when you listen back to it, you can pause it and be like, oh, this was a really good nugget. I'm gonna write down you know, this, these couple of sentences verbatim and I'm gonna work them into my story. And so um, if you've got an iPhone, the voice memos app, that's actually just a default on your phone. Usually you can use that one, audio recorder um, that you see here, that's more for Android folks. And so that's just a free, hack to improve the gathering process because our memories aren't perfect and um, anyway so uh, some key questions to ask through the gathering process I, I really like asking the therefore what question pretty early on you know who's going to care about this um, and I think this is something that we need to think about um, uh, pretty carefully because a lot of the stories that we do could potentially be the same type of story that was done a year ago or the year before that and the year before that because we're covering the same types of stories. And um, what we wanna do is try to find that special thing that makes it novel, makes it worth telling. And if there isn't that thing for that particular event, if it really is just another vanilla event, then maybe we don't um, give it any special coverage. Obviously we, we promote the event, we market the event, we want people to go to the event, but maybe it's not worth the, spending our time to do a recap of it. I think most of the time though, there is going to be something special that we can focus on, but we need to make sure we gather that something special instead of just think through like, okay, it was on this day, it was at this place, and these people were there, there were a couple hundred people that showed up, woo, you know, that's, I. It's not um, horrific, but it's not something that, um, you know, is really benefiting people by reading about if anyone's going to read it. And so um, we want to focus on, on something that really makes this particular person, this particular project, this, this event unique. And I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but you have these basic questions, who, what, when, where, why, how. Um, Usually what makes a story special will be one of those things or a combo of those. Um, and so like I mentioned before, you know, maybe it's, it's not that this event is happening because you know, it happens every year and it follows the same basic format, but this year it's in Russia, you know, then we're focusing on the, the where, um, or maybe it's, you know, the, this particular 
uh, government leader is going to be keynoting and that person is, you know, we know they're wildly popular and so um, we're going to focus on that person and, you know, 90% of our story is really just going to focus on the fact that that person's coming um, and the other little bit will cover some of the more generic bases, but your focus is really going to be on what makes it unique. Um, looking for human elements, looking for personal stories, narratives. People love to read stories. People love to feel emotions. Um, and, and similarly, just trying to find things that build bridges that are universally appealing. Um, you know, everybody loves joy. Everybody loves um, seeing an underdog come through and, and win at something, right? There's th these universally appealing themes that are not controversial that we can we can highlight within a story and those have potential to be shared right because they're getting emotional responses out of people that are positive and then we further the brand of the BYU Law Alumni Association we further the brand of the Jeremy Clark Law Society um, because we're inspiring people in a way that's universally uncontroversially inspiring um, I like to call this the storyteller's funnel. Um, you gather tons of stuff, um, way more than what you use. You never use everything. And so you cast this really broad net. And then the next phase is telling the story. And um, I try not to focus too much on every single word when I'm writing the first draft of a story. I'm just trying to figure out what is the key theme that needs highlighting what do i need to amplify and that part is the hardest part i think um, it takes a lot of creativity to tell a story um, the gather broadly it's really easy you know you get the tools you practice a couple times and you can gather for anybody and you can you know if you don't want to do the writing because you don't feel comfortable with writing you can gather some really good stuff and then give it to somebody else and they can tell the story. The storytelling can be really hard, um, but you're not focusing on perfection. You're just focusing in this phase on, on isolating, you know, what is the story? What is the standout thing that um, could catch eyes and ears and be of interest to as many people as possible? And then um, the next phase is where you take your story which will be a little bit bloated. You know, there's going to be some fluff in there as you're just, you know, writing it the first time because you're just trying to get in a rhythm, get in some flow and just um, put the story down on paper. Then you go through a formulaic kind of checklist, condensing and refining that story, polishing it, making it publishable. And so your story, you know, might become 10, 20% shorter. It will still have all the meat, but it turned out, you know, you had some accidental redundancies in that story when you just put out that initial draft of it. Um, you know, maybe there were some sentences that could have been condensed down. And so that part of the process actually is really relatively easy to teach people to the condensing and refining because it is formulaic, just like the, the gathering process. And so the heart of it where you spend the most time and it's the most stressful is the, the storytelling, but it can also be the most fun. And then the more robotic elements are the, the gathering and condensing and refining. And so um, some things that I have found that have helped to tell the story, and again, it's more of an art than a science. Um, none of these are rules etched in stone that you have to do in any given story, but they, they can be helpful. Um, the first is just a reminder that Again, you're not using everything you gathered. You're just going to magnify the most compelling and you want to ditch any detractors. And so there might be five potential themes to any one story. But rather than trying to hit all five of them, isolate <laughs> one of them that seems really good. And even though the other ones are pretty good, not um, detracting from, from the one that you want to zoom in on. Um, that will help you just tell a, a more um, cohesive story. It will flow a lot better and it, um, it won't feel like the reader's checking off these boxes of, oh, okay, here's this little thing and here's that little thing and oh, by the way, that, that, that. It really, um, if you take that approach where you're hitting a bunch of themes, 
it's um, it's more convoluted and um, it's not as much of a narrative that can suck somebody in and get them emotionally invested in it. One way I like to begin stories is zoomed into a particular moment. And so that video that I showed you at the beginning, right? You had that lady and she's like, I didn't even see my teeth lying there. And she's going back with us to that moment of distress where she's near drowning. You know, she's on the side of the pool clinging for life. She's being weighed down. She doesn't know if her hus husband can hear her. You know, he's inside sleeping and she calls for her neighbor, doesn't know if he's home. And so it really zeroes in on that one critical moment and tries to bring that moment to life. And so um, there are times to surf through a story um, and there's times to dive really deep. And those um, those moments that are most memorable are where we, we dive deep. And so we ask the follow-up questions when we're gathering, you know, if something stands out to us, we go, oh, that's interesting. Like, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, do you remember what it looked like when you were in that situation? Do you remember what it smelled like? Do you remember, you know, what the weather was like? Do you remember um, how you felt emotionally? Like um, zooming in in the gathering process is what makes it possible for us to zoom in in the storytelling process and starting out of the gate zoomed in is a way you can really bring someone into a story um, and again these are just ideas they're not written in stone that you have to begin zoomed in to a moment there are other ways to to begin a story um, but that's one that i found to be really helpful and and similarly out of the gate, I like to keep the reader, the viewer, the listener guessing a little bit. You don't want to bury the lead, but I like the idea of veiling it a little bit, where you're leaving some mystery. It's like, I didn't see my teeth lying there. It's like, well, why are her teeth there? What do you mean your teeth aren't in your mouth? Um, you want to have the, the reader, the listener, the viewer asking questions, especially at the beginning, because in that questioning process, you're engaging, but you don't want to have them ask so many questions so long that they get frustrated and they give up. And so that's why we say you don't bury the lead or you bury the story. Um, but I like the idea of veiling it and then kind of peeling, pulling back the veil step by step. So you're leading them along in, in the mystery. Just mystery is so powerful. And you can take any story and make it a little bit mysterious by, um, by keeping the reader guessing, especially in the beginning. Um, using strong contrasts can be really effective too. Um, I, I don't know if any of you have a graphic design background, but this is the same principle in graphic design to make something eye-catching. You know, you'll have the really big text, really big blocky text, and then you'll have the more scripty small text right beside it. And for whatever reason, that contrast um, really jumps out and feels professional. And you can do the same thing in your storytelling um, by calling out the contrast. And one formula that a lot of folks use and you see in TV shows all the time is this order, chaos, order, where you've got this sequence of contrast. You know, everything was awesome, but then, ah, but in the end it was okay. You know, and so you've got this order, chaos, order, flow. And a lot of times, um, especially nowadays, I feel like the order, the initial order part of that, people just cut that out and they just go chaos, order, because people like to read about chaos and drama and it can kind of pull them in. You're like, oh, well, how is this going to resolve? I need to know how this resolves. And so maybe it's because we don't have the attention span as much as we did before, where we could go through the whole order, chaos, order process. Now, maybe that's why, you know, we just um, do shorter stories, we get right into the chaos, and then we, we try to guess, you know, how is this all going to resolve in a good way? And hopefully it does. And so uh, order, chaos, order, you can use that, or you can just use the chaos order part. But those are just five little things to help with telling the story when you're refining and condensing, and we're actually going to go through an example of trying to do those um, big picture type things. Um, and then we're going to also try to go through the refining and condensing process with an example. So it's not just me yakking. We're going to do a little workshop aspect. So um, some things that I like, you'll hear from most anybody that writes a lot to read aloud. That can be great for catching grammar or flow problems. Um, it also, I mean, can help you get a sense for 
how boring or engaging your content is. When you read it aloud, it, it really helps expose um, how, how well the story came together and whether or not you need to revisit it. So I really like reading aloud when I feel like, okay, I'm pretty close to done here. I'll read it aloud. I'll catch a bunch of grammar things, typos, um, flow issues. Another thing that I like to do is just reduce passive voice and prepositions as much as possible. There are times and places for them, but um, active voice generally is a lot more effective. It's also more concise. Um, if you're not sure what I mean by active voice, you know, I could say that this guy right here, um, you know, the weights are lifted by this guy, right? Or I could say the guy lifts weights. And so the guy lifts weights is your active voice and um, the weights lifted by the guy would be your passive voice. And so a good way to find passives quickly is to just hit control F on your computer and then search the word by. And there might be times where by is okay, right? And makes perfect sense. But there's going to be a few uses of passive that are unnecessary that are make um, the, the text more long-winded and clunky than it needs to be and less engaging. And so uh, that's a quick way to just find where we can swap in the active voice. Same thing with prepositions, um, where we're showing ownership of things. Um, a lot of times we can get rid of ofs by adding a you know, um, apostrophe S and, uh, or, or just changing, uh, the sentence structuring a little bit. And so I like to avoid passives and prepositions. They're, they're not very, uh, vivid. And so, um, here's another big principle, show it like it is. So what I mean by that is we have some options. We can say like, Oh, this guy's important or, He's an amazing attorney. Um, this is super cool, right? We use we could use these adjectives all day long to try to describe how great something is and why people should care about it. But um, people are generally unconvinced by being told. And so rather than using a lot of adjectives to describe, especially the subjective opinion type adjectives, what we want to do is we want to prove to the reader, to the viewer, to the listener, that this really is important. And the way we do that is by including a bunch of details. So, okay, you say that person's important. What do you mean by that? Oh, well, he's a senior partner at the biggest law firm in the world. And, um, you know, so those are some details that go, oh, okay, wow, okay, that's important. And without saying that that person's important, you've You've called it out and you've, you've caused the reader to think, wow, like this is a heavy hitter, right? And so rather than saying this is what it is, show what it is. Um, show the details that prove the, the opinion that you want the reader to have. And without even having to say what your opinion is of it, um, the reader will, will come away feeling that just based on the details. Feel free to interrupt me if you guys have any questions as we're going along here. Um, I feel like I've just been monologuing for a while, and so I'd be happy if you interrupted me. <laughs> but another great tool when you're going through the refining process is to vary sentence lengths. Um, I like using short sentences for emphasis, and if there's times where we just need to cruise through some details, combining sentences and making some longer sentences. So it's I mean, you can't emphasize every sentence, right? Your sentences can't all be three words, four words, five words, because um, then if everything's emphasized, nothing is, right? If everyone's special, no one is. And so you take the details that are less juicy and you can combine them, string them together into some longer sentences so you can cruise through them. And then when you use the short sentences, it's a whole lot more powerful. Um, another thing that I do almost every time I write a story is I go into a thesaurus if I have time and I'll look at some, some words um, and I'll try to find some vivid verbs in particular and I'll look um, for synonyms that can help me with alliteration, right? Where you've got the, the same letter at the beginning of words and obviously you don't want to alliterate everything because um, it's, 
you don't want to oversalt something. And same with consonants, right? Having the same consonant sounds within words and assonants having the same vowel sounds within words. But those can make things a little bit more poetic and musical, and they can be nice to put in here and there. And um, those don't, I mean, to the, to the reader, it might feel like, oh, wow, like this person's a really good writer. Like, that's cool how that pieced together. But um, uh, I feel like anybody can do this really well. Just, you know, crack open a thesaurus and really just Google that word and say synonyms. You know, you had that word. Um, what are some other ways you could say that word and then look through the list and go, which one sounds the best, you know, in this context? And so that's another trick. And then you've probably heard of the rule of threes. There's something powerful behind the rule of threes. It's kind of like the rule of thirds, I guess. Um, but the rule of threes, you have things like faith, hope, and charity. You know, you don't say faith, hope, charity, and something else. Um, for whatever reason, and I don't know what it is, and it could be another chicken or the egg type situation where we've heard it so much that it, be, it feels right or it just naturally is right. And so as I'm going through and I'm working through a piece that I wrote, I'll look at some of my lists and some of the, the parts where I've got different pieces working together and I'll say, hmm, you know, can I take those two pieces and maybe add a third piece that will feel, make it feel more complete? Or those four pieces, do I really need all four? Like what are the three main ones? And oh, okay, actually that fourth one, was a little bit redundant with one of them anyways let's go ahead and cut that out because it feels just a little bit too long-winded and so um that isn't something you need to live by religiously well faith hope and charity yeah you want to live by that religiously but the rule of threes you um you don't have to do it every time it's kind of like a salt a, a spice to really give emphasis to something so I, these are six considerations in the refining and condensing process that i just wanted to point out um, in terms of flow, I think this is something that um, I wanted to dive into a little bit more because I think sometimes we don't think about it and I think it's such an easy victory. And um, as we're going from paragraph to paragraph and sentence to sentence, we want to have a nice chain, you know, we're being led along link by link and sometimes we accidentally break the chain and it's really really easy to fix the chain by just reorganizing the information. And so I've got these two paragraphs here. Reasonableness depends on representation objectives and case value. Objectives are case decided. Um, so the common thread of objectives, so we've got, com we've got objectives talked about in the first sentence and we've got objectives talked about in the second sentence. They're actually separated unnecessarily by the and case value. And so you could restructure that paragraph to say reasonable it depends on case value and representation objectives. Oh, by the way, objectives are client decided, right? And so we're flowing, you know, naturally from representation objectives to a little bit more detail about what we mean by objectives. And so sometimes, you know, when we're doing a rough draft, you're not gonna write everything, you know, linked up perfectly. As you read over it though, you'll be able to recognize um, some of the broken links and just by some little restructuring you can em enhance the flow any questions about that or any questions about any of these other principles that we've talked about so far or comments funny stories okay so I want to go into an example and um, this is what we're going to do for the rest of the time we're going to look at an example of a semi okay story that I, I wrote this morning. And then we're going to try to fix it up. And then we'll look at another way that we could approach the same story. Um, let's see. Tommy, you can't see, right? Or can you? Are you there? All right, I'll just drive ahead. I was going to see if someone would read this for me, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Okay, so here is my bad example, and it's not horrific, um, but it definitely could use some work. So John Doe is senior partner at Baker McKenzie, or is a senior partner. See, reading aloud, you catch things, right? Um, he's an amazing attorney, but what he does in his free time is even more amazing. He has limited time away from his law practice, but every year he and his wife, Sue, spend an entire week in Africa volunteering at an orphanage. 
He's remembered by many of the kids and embraced by them each time he returns. They call him Uncle Johnny. Their favorite thing to do with him is play soccer. Their second favorite thing is to put on a mock trial with him and call him Judge Johnny. The service is not without challenges. John has become sick twice. One time he got a terrible fever, another time food poisoning. But the emotional challenges can sometimes hurt worse. I have a problem where I get attached. I love those kids. There's always a lot of tears when I go home, Doe says. His wife says they found a couple of ways to make the in-between more manageable. We write to each of the children once a month, she says. That has helped the distance sting a little less. Last year, they got an idea. Donations were gathered from friends and family and colleagues at the office to buy the orphanage computers and internet access. That has helped the Doe stay connected even better. It has also helped with the education of the orphans. The computers are loved by the children. The does never see some of the um, the does never see some of the children again. Some get adopted, others grow up and move out. All right, so it's kind of it. It's not a complete story, right? But um, I want to go through some of these questions, and if you can unmute right now to participate, I would love that. If you're not in a situation where you can, that's fine. Or if you don't feel comfortable with it, that's fine too. Um, but I'd love if you did engage with me here. So what is the most compelling theme to this particular story, do you think? If we're thinking of the who, what, when, where, why, how, or some combo of those, what what jumps out to you personally as something that seemed unique and special and interesting? I think that the kids remember him every time. Hmm. So the kids remembering, I like that. Any other themes that jumped out to you guys? One way to isolate themes that could be of interest is to go through the who, what, when, where, why, and how, and ask yourself how special is that particular element. So, um, so the where, Africa orphanage, right? That's where this action is happening. Um, how special is that? Um, you know, there are lots of, there are people that go to orphanages and help them. And a lot of orphanages are in Africa and there is something compelling to that. Um, but it's a little bit limited. Um, the who that's doing it, you know, how often do senior partners at major law firms like Baker and McKenzie take a week to go to an orphanage? Um, you know, that might be something that's a little bit more, more special, right? And how do we how do we call out the who better? Or is it is it the the why behind it? You know, the relationships with the kids and this high-powered attorney and how they call him Uncle Johnny, right? Um, and how they remember him, even though it's been a year, right? And so um, it, it can be helpful to just go through those who, what, when, where, why, how questions and to ask yourself, well, how special is that how compared to that what, you know? and um, is it a combination of things? It's not just that um, it's this high-powered attorney because there's tons of those, right? But it's the fact that this high-powered attorney is going to this place and being remembered. I don't know. And so there, again, this is more of an art than a science when we're trying to find a compelling theme. And what might be a compelling theme to one reader might not necessarily be the most compelling to another but at least going through the process, you have a chance at reaching some of the readers with a compelling theme because some of the readers are going to relate to you and be touched by it if you were touched by it. But if you don't go through the process of isolating that special theme and you just um, gloss over a bunch of themes superficially, then you're not going to touch anybody. Um, how do you feel this story does in keeping the reader guessing? And what could be done to improve that? So we've got John Doe, a senior partner at Baker McKenzie. He's an amazing attorney, but what he does in his free time is even more amazing. I guess you could say that's kind of keeping the reader guessing a little bit, you know, oh, what's he doing in his free time? That's so special, you know. Um, any thoughts that you guys had as I read over this about, I mean, were you asking questions? Did you seem engaged by this? Were there, were there things that we unveiled prematurely? You know, um, do you have any thoughts or comments on that? I know it's not the easiest question. To what is, 
what's the uh, the benefit of the clickbait aspect? The you know what he does in his free time is even more amazing. Um, <laughs> I, I I know there's a marketing thing that's going on here that I I get annoyed by, but I don't understand. Um, but is is there value to it enough that we want to leave it in, or can we take it out? Um, you know, it's, you know, we could just you know, skip something, you know, so, you know, once a year, John Doe, who, you know, who, who works as a senior partner, I'm butchering it, um, yeah. dons a robe and does a mock trial in Africa at an orphanage. Sure. Um, and just, you know, skip right to it and then, you know, and then fill in the details after that. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's, and that is um, a really good question because I don't think you ever want to oversell something and you want to... Um, you want to delay something more than is necessary. You know, like if a fact isn't that crazy or mysterious, then you don't need to to shroud it. And I think um, there are some things that are obnoxious about clickbait, but there are, are also some good principles behind it where people like to ask questions and get their questions answered. And so if a headline causes them to ask a question, they're more likely to engage, but it doesn't mean that the question has to be an outrageous question or a, a superlative or a, a, you know, a hyperbolic type thing where it's like these 10 things will change your life forever. It's like, no, they won't, you know, but um, so you don't want to oversell because I think it, particularly with our audience where we're, we're creating content, by attorneys for other attorneys. I think attorneys are more annoyed by that kind of overselling than um, non-attorneys because we're just constantly reading things with a critical eye. And so we have our, our radar up for the oversold. And um, so I, I really appreciate that comment. Um, did you have any other thoughts on that? Well, I like the, the idea of the painting the picture and, you know, you talked earlier about focusing in on a small detail and then, you know, coming out. Um, and I think that the, you know, starting out is, you know, talking about how, you know, he, you know, we, we, we moved from, um, you know, Salt Lake, I'm assuming, <laughs> Baker and McKenzie to, you know, suddenly he's in Africa and he's, you know, what's he doing in Africa? Well, he's volunteering at an orphanage and, and why does he volunteer in an orphanage? And I like how, um, you know, the, 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 as the story unfolds, you find that it's not just a week a year. They're writing um, to the kids every month. Um, then they, uh, you know, they, they supply them with computers. They can com communicate with them even more. Um, mm -hmm. And then the story kind of stops, obviously. But um, <laughs> yes, I, I like that, that development that, you know, this is not just a, a week a year. Mm -hmm. um, so, but and I think that it, I think you can also you know have more of the, that emotion in there. I um, think that's absolutely um, right. I think that's good criticism because um, you know, like we said before, you can zoom into a particular moment and you can really capture and bring something to life. And when I'm reading through this story, there's a couple parts where I'm like, ooh, like I'd love a little bit more detail about like how did this Uncle Johnny thing come about? You know, he's obviously not their uncle. Um, he plays soccer with them. You know, what is, what is that like? I mean, is this a six year old partner, <laughs> you know, in dress suit shoes running around or what, what, um, and then this mock trial, you know, bring that to life for me. What, what are some things that the kids said in the mock trial? You know, is there a funny memory from that or a really touching memory from that or just something interesting? Like there has to be something interesting there, you know? And so getting more of the details so you can bring that to life and then maybe leading with that kind of thing where you, you zoom in on that story and you go, oh, okay, like these kids really have this special relationship with someone and maybe later you have it unveiled that, oh my gosh, that someone is this attorney that I know at that big firm. I had no idea he was doing that. Um, that's super cool. And so um, zooming into a particular moment, this story does not do very well at all. Um, uh, it's not an awful story, but it definitely could use some work. There is a little bit of order, chaos order. You know, here's some challenges. He gets sick, and also he gets sad when he leaves, and here's what he's doing to take care of it, though. Um, I think we could also have done better on this story in identifying some universals. Um, you know, obviously, people want to feel loved. They want to have family, and um, 
you know, this Uncle Johnny thing, it looks like a potential to latch on to the need for family a little bit harder and to call that out and to, to show how this attorney has really, you know, met these emotional needs of these kids in at least some little degree. And so, um, anyways, those are, uh, just some, some thoughts that I had in when I wrote this basic story. So I, I just kind of dreamt up some facts and plucked together this story. And then I said, okay, now I'm going to try to apply the principles we've been talking about and rewrite this story. And so I looked at kind of those big picture questions. And then also, um, you know, you go through, you read aloud, does it flow any grammatical problems, unnecessary prepositional phrases, passive voice, Certainly there's some of that. The computers are loved by the children. That's just a ridiculous sentence I put in there. <laughs> you know, the children love the computers, right? Um, uh, but it, it's surprising how much passive can creep in unnecessarily and how much um, prepositions can, can sneak in unnecessarily, right? And so um, it, it's very helpful for me to just go through kind of this checklist of, you know, and, now I'm going to look at the sentences. How's my sentence length? I'm using a lot of really short sentences. Is that necessary? Um, am I having the right sentences be short and the right sentences be long? And again, the longer sentences are going to be the content that you're de-emphasizing. They're okay facts. You know, they're good, but they're not amazing. And then the shorter ones are the ones that we're going, we're going to really make jump out. Um, and then I'm going to look through, you know, which words could possibly benefit from a thesaurus check. You know, is there something where I just felt like, uh, I don't know, I say amazing a, a few times, but actually, do I even want to say amazing, right? I should be showing, not telling. I, I should prove to them that this person is amazing by the facts of the story rather than by just saying it. And so, okay, I'm not even going to go down the amazing rabbit hole because I'm going to just actually cut that all out. and prove it. Um, can the rule of threes be utilized somehow? Um, you know, I, maybe at the end here, maybe I could say the does never see some of the children again. So some get adopted, others grow up and move out. So that's two things. Maybe there's a third thing I'm forgetting about. You know, um, maybe ask a follow-up question. You know, how, is, them how is the health care? You know, sadly, there might be some that pass away from year to year, right? From disease, from malnutrition. And so if that's the case, then certainly I don't want to omit that um, because that, though it's a sad truth, it should be part of part of the story. So I could add that and then I've completed, you know, some get adopted, others grow up and move out. Sadly, some pass away, you know? And so uh, again, it's a spice. You don't want to over spice. And then this last one, show, don't tell. How many times am I Am I trying to tell someone how great something is, how ugly something is, how terrible something is, versus how many, you know, times I'm showing those things? You know, I say a terrible fever. Maybe I could change that in some way, you know, by saying is a fever of 105, 100, and, you know, it lasted for this many days, he lost 10 pounds, right? That brings the fever to life. And you could say those things pretty quickly without it taking a, a ton of time. You know, one time he got a fever that got up to 105 degrees, lasted four days, and he lost 15 pounds. You know, that's way better than saying one time he got a terrible fever. And so in, in order to write this, like, again, you've got to cast that really broad net in your gathering phase by asking those kind of questions where they say, oh, one time I got really sick. Well, it's like, what do you mean by that? Well, I got a fever. Okay, well, how hot did it get? Okay, do you remember? Or how long did it last? Did you lose some weight? You know, ask those types of questions, and then you've laid the foundation to be able to, to show rather than just tell. And sometimes we need to coax the people we interview to show us too, and not just tell us. Um, so now I just want to, in the last couple minutes that are left, then this is another example of the same story. It's not perfect. There's definitely different ways you could go about it. I, you know, I'm still learning how to write myself, but this is a way that perhaps you could approach those same types of facts while um, zooming into a moment, bringing it more to life and um, showing rather than telling and um, having the facts more, uh, just working more naturally and keep the reader hanging a little bit. So it starts out, um, 
Uncle Johnny, let's play soccer, squeaked a familiar voice through the wooden slat wall. The wall muffled the voice, but only a little. Sunlight poured through the wall's gaps, exposing the dust dancing in the room. The young girl stepped closer to the wall. Now he could hear her heavy breathing, and the peeling lumber framed some of her bright white teeth. He loved soccer, but that day he could hardly stand, let alone romp around, even if his favorite orphans had begged him. Sweat dripped from his forehead, and his stomach did somersaults. Food poisoning is rarely pretty, so they'd have to get along without him. He silently prayed he'd be back on his feet before he and his wife returned home to New York City. Going home was never fun, but it was going to be harder this year. Milo, Sam, and Jenny were getting older. After years of coming back each autumn to volunteer at the orphanage for a week away from Baker and Mackenzie, the senior partner had been there from baby babble to scraped knees and then puberty, and now they'd be moving out soon. John Doe and his wife, Sue, may not see the three of them again. He'd miss the younger ones too, of course, but they'd write letters and call them via Skype on the computers and over the internet connection that the Doe's helped donate. That softened the sting some, but there were no guarantees they'd be able to connect with any of the children once they grew up. Um, whoops, I touched a key and lost the story. Um, I have a problem where I get attached. I love those kids, Doe says, dot, 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 and the story progresses. And so you can see how I'm capturing the same facts, right? We got in here, this is a senior attorney from Baker McKenzie. He's there with his wife, he's going there. Um, we know that he's going there year after year, but we just reorganized and restructured in a way and, and zoomed in and brought, you know, some of the details out. And again, you can't do that unless you ask those types of questions in the gathering phase, you know, like, tell me about that time you got food poisoning, you know, tell me about, um, what it looked like there and, um, what it felt like. And do you have, you know, any particular stories about, um, you know, just memories, right? I would love to bring a memory to life and just tell that narrative so people can share in your experience. And so, um, again, this is not a perfect story in any way, shape or form, and it might not be as engaging, you know, hearing me read it here because you already know the this, this story because, you know, so I'm not leading you along as much as someone who hadn't heard the first story, but I hope it's at least a little bit helpful and maybe sparks some ideas in your own writing about how to, you know, zoom in, start by zooming in, pulling out some details, um, showing, not telling, right? Um, focusing on the human aspects and rather than trying to cover every base superficially, you know, really hammering home this, the, the main thing and uh, telling the narrative. So, you guys have any questions before we wrap up? We've been close to an hour and, um, you know, we've had a couple of great comments, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about writing. And by no means am I an expert in these kind of things, but with the experience that I do have, those are just some things that have helped me so far. And I hope they're helpful for you. This has been really great. This is Nancy, and I have a cold and some allergies, and so I'm just trying to lay low and, and kind of listen. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right, well, um, if nobody has any burning questions, we can wrap up, but feel free to email me or call me if you have questions too. Because um, I like thinking about writing and how to improve writing and anytime I think about it, it improves my own writing So it won't be a burden to me to think through whatever questions you might have will just help my own writing improve so, Thank you guys so much for taking some time for this you know, You're all exceptionally busy and if you're not writing in newsletters and you're just writing briefs, you know so Hopefully some of these things will help too. I think the showing rather than telling powerful principle and any kind of persuasion. And so there's applications beyond the newsletter, beyond the blog post, if that makes sense. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna bow out. Thank you guys. Thanks, Thank Adam. You. This is really inspiring.